Okay, so thank you so much for um, asking me to speak uh, in part on this topic today. Um, and so as, as noted, we'll talk a bit about pulmonary arterial venous malformations in HHT. And can I, there we go. So we're gonna talk a little bit about a pulmonary venous malformation, uh, how frequent they are, um, how we detect these and why we detect uh, these in, in terms of the guideline-based treatment and some of the techniques that are used. Uh, complications of untreated uh, pulmonary AVMs, or I could say even large uh, pulmonary AVMs, and then um, uh, talk a bit about the, the treatment of pulmonary AVMs with Dr. Uh, Prabhusai. So as we know, uh, arteries are blood vessels that leave the heart and, and go out to either the lungs or the body. And in the schematic on the, on the right here, we have a pulmonary artery in, in blue traveling out to some of the lung um, alveoli or the small units uh, of the lung that exchange air. And, and coming back, uh, we bring back pulmonary veins, bring back that oxygenated blood. And the usual interface between those arteries and veins is a small network of blood vessels that are called capillaries. The pulmonary AVM is, is a structural abnormality in that pulmonary blood vessel unit and, and an abnormality between the connection of the pulmonary artery system and the pulmonary vein system. And that um, connection does not pass through the normal small network of capillaries. So on the left side of the screen here, we have one of the pulmonary arteries depicted in blue. And as it goes down, it narrows and the blood vessels get smaller and smaller. And you can see they get smaller and smaller and then they form capillaries and then they start to get larger again as they drain into pulmonary veins. When there's a, an abnormality of that connection, we can get a pulmonary arterial venous malformation where we don't have that normal tapering and we have a, a, a structural abnormality of the uh, artery to vein connection that can either be a simple uh, um, connection or it can be more complex where there might be multiple arteries leading into that um, uh, abnormal connection. I think that pulmonary AVMs affect somewhere between 30 and 50% of people with HHT. And there is some um, difference between the different uh, genes and, and maybe the, the frequency with which pulmonary AVMs occur. However, in, in a way, um, we know that everyone with HHC can get pulmonary AVMs and thus everyone needs screening irrespective of some of those um, uh, differences in the uh, genes responsible for HHT. To do the flip side, we know that most people who have pulmonary AVMs um, have or will be found to have HHT. Um, and 80% of those with pulmonary AVMs are felt to have um, or develop HHT. Shouldn't say develop, be found to have HHT. Um, pulmonary AVMs and HHT are more, more commonly in the lower lobes. And I have a little cartoon on the right here with the right lung having three lobes, the upper, middle, and lower lobe, and the left lung having two lobes, the upper and lower. We know that the most common location is it within the lower lobes on both sides. We have um, guidelines on, on, on how to screen and how to uh, detect and manage uh, pulmonary AVMs. And um, uh, with those guidelines, we know that everyone with possible HHT or confirmed HHT, the, the medical recommendation would be for those people to be screened to look for pulmonary AVMs. And um, transthoracic contrapsychocardiography is the preferred screening test. And so on the right here, we have someone having an echocardiogram whereby it's an ultrasound of their heart. And um, with a contrast echocardiogram, um, an intravenous line is uh, placed and bubbles are created by agitating some, some saline or um, uh, to create bubbles that are then instilled and we look for those through the heart. So if we think of the normal pulmonary circuitry, we showed a bit of a, a slide at the beginning of just one of those units of the alveoli where the blood vessel goes to the gas exchange unit and, and the, the, the very uh, small air sac within the lungs. But um, it's a complex uh, system of, of blood delivery uh, to and from the heart, where we have blood coming from the body back into the right side of the heart depicted in blue here from both the upper and lower um, parts of the body. Um, and then it is delivered out to the lungs, both lungs, and before coming back into the, the left side of the heart depicted in right here. And at that stage, the blood is then delivered elsewhere to the body. 
So if we use my simple cartoon, <laughs> um, we have uh, the body where, where the blood is coming back into the heart and then moving to the lungs. So the uh, veins of the body drain blood into the heart. And we have the right side of the heart here and the left side of the heart there. And then from there, the blood moves up into the lungs. It transits through the lungs and, and exchanges the gases and um, picks up oxygen and expels carbon dioxide before coming back to the heart and thereafter being distributed elsewhere to the body. And if we use a, a contrast um, echocardiogram, it's almost like having a, 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 ca a, a connection into one of those veins that are bringing blood back from the body to the heart. And we put some bubbles in that um, uh, in that uh, intravenous. And so as those bubbles travel to the heart, we can see bubbles on the right side of the heart. So on this image here, we have an echocardiogram. Um, and uh, this is the ultrasound of the heart where we're, we have a, a, a probe looking at the heart from the outside of the chest. And on the left side here, well, it's to the right, but it's the left for the individual. <laughs> we have the, the left side of the heart and the right side of the heart. And so when we have those bubbles transit to the heart, we see all of these bubbles filling up the, the space in, in the right side of the heart. From there, those bubbles continue on and go to the lungs. But the normal network of blood vessels within the lungs filters out those bubbles and they don't let them through. And that's because of those pictures shown earlier of the really fine, almost lattice work connection of the blood vessels between the pulmonary arteries and veins. So we don't see any bubbles come back into the heart on the left side. And we have no pulmonary AVM in that scenario. Now, if we were to have a connection in the lungs here, I've drawn a little, again, a little cartoon of a pulmonary AVM. Because we don't have that normal tapering and that normal um, uh, uh, lattice work of, of blood vessels, um, we can have those blood vessels that we can have those bubbles go through those blood vessels. So those bubbles can transit through that AVM and travel back to the heart. And in that scenario, what we see on the uh, echocardiogram is we start to see those bubbles show up on the other side of the heart. And in that scenario, we do have a pulmonary AVM. So that's the preferred screening test for, um, for detecting pulmonary AVMs in individuals with possible or definite um, HHT. So if we have that, we look for this contrast echocardiogram. Now, if that is negative, and that was the first scenario where we don't have any of those bubbles, we think with a high degree of confidence, pulmonary AVMs are excluded. If that is, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, if that is possible, or if that's positive, we think there's the possibility that there are pulmonary AVMs and, and the possibility that there are pulmonary AVMs that need treatment. So we move on to a CT scan of the chest. And the guidelines, in fact, would also say in certain scenarios, depending on uh, the resources available, um, it may be appropriate to move from suspected or confirmed HHT to a CT scan, depending on where you are, although it's not necessarily the, the, the first test that is uh, advocated for. And the reason to move on to that CT scan is that um, we, the echocardiogram, the contrast echocardiogram may tell us there's a connection, but we don't know if that connection is large or small or where it may be. And the CT scan of the chest gives good definition to sort through those factors. How big is the AVM, where it may be located? And so it gives more information about the specific location and structure. So if that CT scan is done, and oh, I think uh, one of my things didn't show up there. And if the CT scan does not show any AVMs, um, we suspect either there's the possibility of micro AVMs, and those are AVMs too small to be visualized by the CT scan, or there is the potential that the echocardiogram was falsely positive. And in that scenario, we, we still monitor um, individuals and uh, do other uh, more longitudinal testing. If a pulmonary AVM is identified, then we evaluate whether that AVM um, would be recommended for treatment or not. And irrespective of whether treatment is or isn't recommended, we continue to, to monitor them for reasons that will be discussed later. 
So if we do have this connection, um, the next the next thought would be, well, why why do we treat and and, and what are the potential risks uh, of of uh, having a pulmonary AVM that would be untreated if if large? And um, pulmonary AVMs can both result in structural changes to the lungs, but also changes to some of the normal functions and the normal circulation within the lungs and, and can have, result in loss of some of those functions. So with a thin walled structure, um, uh, with a slightly different composition of the, the walls of that structure compared to pulmonary capillaries, um, those walls can also be exposed to higher pressure. And so when you have changes to the structure and changes to the flow and pressure through those um, uh, pulmonary AVMs, there's a risk of rupture, although rare, but there is a risk of rupture of that AVM. Some of the initial reports would suggest the rates of rupture are high, although in those uh, reports, only 29% of uh, the AVMs were detected for usual screening. So many uh, individuals did not necessarily have screening that detected those pulmonary AVMs, but other reasons. And then other studies looking a little bit at more recent records have found a, a lower risk of rupture with a study of over 800 patients and only, um, or 800 people with HHT, only 22 cases uh, of rupture and all were in untreated pulmonary AVM. If we then think of the, the function of the lung and, and, and how a pulmonary AVM may impact that function, we have many functions uh, of the lung to, to, to think of. And, and one of the first ones we think of is moving air in and out of the environment. But uh, pulmonary AVMs, even multiple pulmonary AVMs are not thought to affect the uh, volumes or flows or, or um, ability to move air in and out of, uh, of the lungs. We do think about the ability to exchange oxygen and um, in some individuals and in uh, some scenarios where there are many um, AVMs or very large AVMs, we can have an impact, uh, particularly on the oxygen, although many people will not have uh, any impact on oxygen with um, uh, smaller uh, AVMs. The other aspect we think about as it relates to changes in the function of the lung with AVMs would be the uh, ability of our pulmonary circulation and the microcirculation to, in a way, provide a, a filtering uh, process within our lung. So if we look at the cartoon in the left, as we've talked about the, the normal uh, or the, the usual pattern of uh, pulmonary uh, blood circulation is to move from a larger artery to a smaller artery and down to very, very fine um, microcirculation connections before then traveling back to the heart via a pulmonary vein. And if, um, if something were to try and travel down this pathway, uh, a, a, a substance of some type, it might get stuck or caught somewhere. So it doesn't necessarily continue on towards the pulmonary vein and thus back to the heart. Whereas if we have a, a pulmonary AVM on, on this side, because we have a loss of that small architecture, we can have um, substances travel through. But the way I think of it, the lungs in that sense, and, and everyone's lungs, is have, have a, like a spaghetti strainer almost to catch um, uh, unwanted substances. And so if we have damage to that spaghetti strainer, we have a hole in it or something, or it out, we might lose some, some, some substances through it. And, and when we think about pulmonary AVMs uh, specifically, we think about what are the possible things that can go through that microcirculation that might not be caught if they were to travel through a pulmonary AVM. And one of those things might be small blood clots, one possibility. Uh, one might be air, if there's air coming through an IV catheter. And the other might be bacteria, if bacteria are transiently introduced into the bloodstream, which can happen uh, with certain conditions or procedures. So if we think of that last scenario of uh, bacteria, bacteria can transiently enter the blood for, from, for different reasons, sometimes related to medical conditions or medical events, and, and sometimes related to medical procedures. Um, and if bacteria uh, passes through the lungs, the lungs may filter some of those bacteria out as part of their function. If they pass through an ABM and, and there's the loss of that filtering capacity, uh, that bacteria can then travel back to the heart and potentially be distributed to places in the body. 
And one of the concerns um, related to bacteria passing through pulmonary AVMs would be causing an infection in the brain. So that can be called a brain abscess, uh, an infected collection in the brain. Um, if there are pulmonary AVMs and bacteria passes through them in that, in that way. The other concern we have relates to the first substance I spoke of in the small blood clots. And, and if small blood clots um, are normally filtered out by the pulmonary uh, circulation, the pulmonary networks, um, then uh, if they pass through an AVM, that small blood clot can travel elsewhere in the body. And one of the uh, risks that we are concerned about would be that small blood clot traveling up and traveling to the brain because that can cause what we call an embolic stroke. Embolic means it's traveled to the brain and block some of the small uh, blood supply to the brain. Now, the, the pulmonary um, feeding artery, the artery leading to the AVM, is likely a factor in, in, in that uh, risk. There's some other um, studies that suggest there might be other factors and the relationship might not be as strong as, as, as maybe once thought, but, but I, I think there's probably some factor related to the uh, artery size. And so treatment is pursued to, to reduce that risk uh, of stroke associated with pulmonary avian. So at this time, I think uh, if Dr. Prabhasai is ready, I can um, move forward with some of these other slides. Good morning. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Apley, for uh, the wonderful uh, discussion on pulmonary AVMs, uh, how to uh, define, diagnose, and follow up. And uh, I would like to thank HHC Canada and Dr. Fonan for uh, uh, inviting me for this uh, uh, conference. It's a pleasure to be here. I'll be talking about the treatment of pulmonary AVMs. So if I could uh, just share my screen, please. Thank you. Can everybody see my side? Okay, thank you. Okay. So we've seen some of these slides where uh, patients have telangiectasia and vascular malformations in uh, all parts of the body. I will be focusing on the treatment of uh, pulmonary AVMs. And as Dr. Apple mentioned that uh, the pulmonary AVMs, you know, we have this uh, pulmonary artery Typically, arteries are depicted in red, but for the pulmonary circulation, we talk about them in blue because they carry blood that does not contain oxygen. So that's the one on top. That's the capillaries in the pulmonary bed and the pulmonary veins that carry oxygenated blood back to the heart. That's depicted in red here. So um, Dr. Apple also mentioned about the AVMs. So basically losing the filter function in the lungs and this could be in various different sizes and shapes. Uh, first off is an AV fistula uh, and with an aneurysm, or it could be uh, a bunch of abnormal channels, all of which are dilated and once again, losing the filter function. So typical treatment these days is catheter, angiogram and embolization. Uh, before we had this technique, surgery was the preferred or possibly the only treatment option for patients who had peak vascular malformations in the lung. So, um, you know, the, the management of these AVMs does not stop once they are treated. Uh, they still need to be followed forever. So that is usually with CT. And of course, the patients would need to take the AVM precautions that will be mentioned later on. And of course, the uh, docs are also going to be following them up. So what is the treatment? 
uh, treatment is embolization. Embolization essentially means stopping the flow of blood through a blood vessel. So once the patient's been screened and they have AVMs that are considered significant, and usually the significant AVM is the one with the feeding artery that is roughly three millimeters or larger, or any AVM that has been uh, causing symptoms or AVM that have been treated previously and have opened up again. So for that, we usually put in this type of small plastic tube into the blood vessels in the body and we inject the x-ray dye, take pictures. And Dr. Fornin has shown a couple of pictures like this. This is a catheter in the lung and the x-ray dye that has been injected outlines the abnormal blood vessel. This is the aneurysm or the fistula and this is the blood going back to the heart. And for the purposes of embolization, we use materials such as coils. These are essentially tiny uh, metallic uh, materials. So you can think about them like slinkies, but with fiber on top of them. So, you know, in the, in the uh, products, the fiber is attached. And what this fiber does is it encourages blood to clot. And once the fiber which acts as a clotting agent, plus the metallic material within the coils and the blood clot together, they will form a mechanical barrier to the blood flow. So this procedure is performed by an interventional radiologist and uh, the recommendation is that it should be done at an HG center that does high volume of these cases because although this procedure can be performed by any interventional radiologist, there are certain nuances and certain things that can go wrong with uh, patients that have PAVMs, especially in the setting of HHT, that ideally should be managed by people who do high volume. We almost never do this under GA. We use what is called conscious sedation. The patients are awake, and if they are nervous or anxious, we give them sedatives just to relax them, except for a few uh, patients. So pediatric age group, would be done under general anesthesia or patients that may not be able to tolerate for various reasons, we usually give them either heavy sedation or have anesthesia present in the room. The patients are uh, you know, laid flat on the x-ray table. It's also called a fluoroscopy table. We monitor them throughout the procedure. And that monitoring includes uh, monitoring their uh, blood pressure, their oxygen saturation, their ECG, and <clears throat> and their heart rate. We call it a procedure, but uh, it's actually treated as surgery. So absolute sterile precautions are used. So the way we access the uh, blood vessel, we typically use a blood vessel, which is called the femoral vein. It's the top of the thigh. We put in a small needle and then we put in a plastic tube and we use the angiographic catheter to do the uh, pictures initially and then take pressures. I'll show a picture of that in a, uh, in a couple of seconds. And then once we've got all the pictures, we make sure that there are there is one or there are more than one AVMs. Then we decide to go for a different kind of catheter, which we call the treatment catheter. And every center or every radiologist has a different kind of system that they use. Regardless of the system that is used, the technique that we follow is what we call a meticulous technique in that we have to make sure that air bubbles or blood clots are not introduced into the catheter system because if that is done, then we actually land up with complications that we are hoping to avoid or prevent by treating these AVMs. And the blood vessel that we need to treat are embolized or blocked with what is called cross-sectional occlusion. And we try and go as close to the AVM as possible. So these techniques were initially uh, you know, described by Dr. White and uh, they have been modified, maybe refined as technology has improved, the uh, hardware has improved, the technique has improved and our imaging capacity has improved. One of the techniques that we use is called the anchor technique. So this is the catheter that is in the blood vessel supplying the AVM, and that's the vein that takes the blood back to the heart. So what we have to do is to get a catheter all the way to what we call the neck. The neck is where the artery 
and the AVM or the aneurysm meet. So this is the catheter that's coming across and we try and put the coil, the embolic agent that I showed a picture of earlier, into a branch. And the whole purpose of this is that this coil should not travel through the aneurysm and then back to the heart and it can then go any place in the body. And the worst case would be if it goes into the brain, it will cause a stroke. So what we have to do is to anchor this and then we deploy the coil. As I said, it's like a slinky, very, very soft, and it causes cross-sectional occlusion. And that's the end result, okay? So we've selected the catheter, injected, sorry, we selected the uh, anchoring blood vessel, we put the tip of the coil inside it, and then start depositing the coils. And that's the final result. That's what it looks like. Anchor and the cross-sectional occlusion with the coils. So this is a case that we did a few years back. The catheter in the blood vessel in the right lung. This is the AVM, that's the artery supplying the vascular malformation. This is the AVM, the aneurysm, and that's the contrast going back to the heart. A different picture a few seconds later, showing the blood vessels opacified or lighting up elsewhere in the lungs. Now we're going very selective. That's the anchoring blood vessel. You can see that. And we deploy the coil or the anchor inside the anchoring blood vessel and then the rest of the material in the AVM. And then once we have finished, we do a, an angiogram or a picture again, and we see that that AVM is not filling up again. Okay, second technique we use, it's called the scaffold technique. So same catheter, the idea is to use a coil, which is a bigger coil than the AVM, and this acts like a scaffold. High, high pressure against the blood vessels. The whole idea is does not move forward. Once we fill this up, we have to fill up the interstices of the scaffold with smaller coils, softer coils. So in the end, what we get is the cross-sectional occlusion of the blood vessel. So an example of the scaffold technique. This patient has an AVM on the left side. This is the catheter through the heart into the left lung, and this is the entire left lung. So we select the AVM. This is the artery that supplies the AVM. This is the aneurysm. This is the vein that takes the blood back to the heart. We go as close to the neck as possible, the tip of the catheter in the neck, all the way back, and we start deploying the coils, weaving it. So we make a big nest, big nest, and then we fill up the nest with softer coils. So when we are finished, it looks like a ball of metal with no flow through it. Okay. Another one. This one is what we call it's a complex vascular malformation. Not just one artery going into the aneurysm or and one vein, it looks like a bunch of grapes, very complex. Okay. All right, so now that we have selected it, we put in this coil or the scaffold, and then we fill it up with softer coils. Once again, when we finish, there is no flow through it. So the filter function, is, or I should say the filter malfunction is stopped, okay? And this is what an X-ray would look like after somebody had embolization of their AVMs. So this patient had AVMs in both lungs. Each of them was treated, okay? Now there, there are newer techniques or different techniques that have been described. So as I mentioned, the first technique was the anchor technique. The second one was the scaffold technique. And sometimes we use what is called as an occlusion balloon. Now, this is a fairly large AVM, which is a large volume of blood flow. Okay. When we select it, there is no anchoring vessel. I can't use a scaffold technique because the vein on the outside is actually bigger than the vein that, oh, sorry, the artery that supplies the aneurysm. If I were to put a big scaffold, it would 
migrate through and going back into the heart. So that's why here we've used a slightly different technique. In this patient, we actually have two catheters, one that has got a balloon in it. And the whole idea of a balloon is to stop the inflow of blood. And the second catheter is allowing us to place the coils in. Because there is no forward flow, this coil will not move into the heart. Okay. And now that we've got that occlusion, we can then completely exclude this AVM. So when you're finished, this is what it looks like. A huge mass of metal completely blocking the abnormal blood vessel and aneurysm. Okay. This is what an x-ray would look like of somebody who has a big AVM. This is the heart. This is the AVM. On a chest x-ray, we just cannot confirm that this is an AVM. This looks like any mass. So that's why, as Dr. Appley mentioned, we need to do a CT to confirm and document and characterize the AVM. Once patients have had the embolization done, this is what the material would look like. The AVM is still visible. Over time, it gradually gets smaller. So on a CT scan, AVM in the right lung, after we embolized it, it pretty much disappears. It gets smaller. So in summary, embolization of the AVM, my job is one of the easiest jobs. Most difficult job is my respirology colleagues. They are the ones who manage the patient. They are the ones who diagnose it. And you know, I'm just left treating these patients relatively easy compared to what my colleagues are doing. This procedure, embolization, is uh, relatively safe and uh, very well tolerated. The complications are relatively minor. Uh, patients may have palpitations. That's when the catheter is going through the heart and the heart feels as if they either skip to beat or it starts to beat too rapidly. And of course it's scary. So that's the reason why we may have to sedate them. Sometimes some of our patients do have chest pain that could be related to the catheter through the heart and in the lungs. Short, short uh, lasting chest pain, again, very easy manage with pain control. After we embolize the AVMs, some of our patients do have chest pain later on, and uh, they are again managed by my colleagues, usually with uh, painkillers. Rare complications of groin bruising or hematoma where we access the blood vessels. The most dreaded complication is the paradoxical embolization or the complication that we are hoping to avoid by treating these is that the small particles that we are placing or a blood clot or air bubble goes through the AVM and then causes a complication. It is rare and with good technique, exceedingly rare. And uh, we've, been, uh, we've been lucky and we've, we've not had to deal with any of these complications. Thank you, and uh, hand back to Dr. Abney now. Thank you so much. I would say that the comment on your job being easy is potentially a simplistic view. I think it, it requires a lot of expertise and in, in something that uh, that uh, you know I know uh, everyone and your patients and colleagues appreciate, of course. So I, I don't know if I fully agree with that comment, but uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and and so th yeah, and thank you so much. And so the, the just the last slide that was going to speak to was a little bit of the the precautions around um, uh, pulmonary arterial venous malformations. And so many of those are targeted towards some of the potential complications or or um, consequences uh, of pulmonary arterial venous malformations. And and one of those would be the the idea that small bits of bacteria or um, other infection that are transiently introduced into the the bloodstream, which can happen with certain procedures, including uh, dental work, including um, uh, endoscopies or uh, gastrointestinal procedures. And so the the recommendations include the use of a prophylactic antibiotic um, before those types of procedures. 
to reduce that risk of uh, bacteria developing. And then um, if develops into quantities that can pass through uh, AVMs, go elsewhere into the body. And so that is one of the, the recommendations for anyone with a uh, pulmonary uh, AVM, whether it be um, treated, untreated, or suspected uh, on, on the basis of a positive contrast echocardiogram that shows that there are some bubbles passing through the pulmonary circuit uh, and into the left heart, irrespective of whether those are seen uh, as um, AVMs on the CT scan because of the possibility of those micro AVMs. The other um, aspect um, to consider would be if if someone with HHG requires an intravenous catheter, an IV catheter, uh, we want to uh, be cautious about ensuring air does not pass through that catheter. Um, and certain things like um, CT scans where higher volume injections of contrast and other materials are going through the catheter. Um, it's not uh, something we use any, any filters on, but in scenarios where there's an intravenous catheter and there is a possibility of air going through, if the expertise exists to, to use a filter on, on that catheter to filter out the air, it's, a, it's also a recommendation. And lastly, would be a recommendation to avoid um, scuba diving for the for the reasons that uh, the theoretical risk that if if air bubbles were to form upon ascent from from you know, the bottom of the ocean then we wouldn't want those air bubbles to potentially pass through a pulmonary AVM as well so i think with that we have about uh, oh didn't go sorry Great. So thank you so much to um, HHG Canada, Dr. Fond and, and everyone else. And I think there's eight or nine minutes, maybe, question. Thank you so much, Dr. Apoli and Dr. Prabhudesai for talking with us about the development of and treatments for pulmonary AVMs. So we have a few questions for you guys both, if it's okay to start asking them now. Um, the first of which is, how often should screening for pulmonary AVMs take place? The, the first time point to think of is, is when HHG is suspected or diagnosed. Um, uh, and so the, 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 the first time point is to screen um, everyone at, at the outset for when, when the diagnosis is suspected or, or confirmed. Thereafter, I think, you know, there are a few different factors that that um, depend. If you think of the scenario whereby people have that conscious echocardiogram and we don't identify um, any of the bubbles on the other side, indicating there's no passage or no shunt, so to speak, through through the lungs, then the time interval could be up to five years. The, um, and, and even, you know, some other... Um, newer studies suggesting maybe that could even be longer um but for now probably uh five years is the 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 maximum length of time between uh between screening that would be recommended although as as things change that that recommendation may change as well um and i suppose thinking of the question maybe that's the question regarding screening um thereafter as as as, as mentioned by dr um Prabhu Desai, the um People with pulmonary AVMs, even treated pulmonary AVMs, require, um, I don't know if I'd call it screening, but require monitoring for, for uh, the new development and uh, the, um, uh, the possibility that the, uh, the treatment um, could um, have residual blood throw that, that ends up going through it over time. So I guess from a screening perspective, if the, everything is... Um, negative on the first echocardiogram, right now we'd say the maximum length being five years would be my comment, although I know Dr. Fondon might have other comments regarding that interval. And sorry, Dr. Prabhu Desai as well, I, don't, I apologize, any thoughts? No, it's, uh, it's, uh, I agree with that. And, uh, you know, the three to five years is, um, everybody tries and does it like that. Uh, the one caveat I would say, it's, you know, every center that may do it slightly differently because the monitoring, and you're absolutely right, once we have diagnosed it and treated it, we are not screening, we are monitoring it. Yeah. Since the scan technique may 
vary um you know the duration actual duration may slightly vary as well because at our center we use low dose non-contrast chest cts some centers i know they use standard dose and some centers even use contrast cts so um the practice varies uh, as long as one is confident and you know there is rigorous evidence to support what they're doing it could be anywhere between three to five years marie I completely agree with both of you. Thank you. Thank you. You kind of uh, mentioned this in your answer, um, but it seems like pulmonary AVMs may be may spontaneously um, worsen based on the need for monitoring. So is there any possibility of pulmonary AVMs spontaneously resolving by themselves as well? I suppose any I would I would say that um, I don't think that would be a usual pattern. I know there have been some uh, case reports, and those are often um, reports published in the scientific uh, literature where uh, maybe someone has had a hormone treatment for for another cause, and 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 uh, and the uh, I'm thinking of one in particular where where an ABM is reduced in size. But I would say that's not the the usual uh process and i would say it's not something that um one should likely expect nor nor um do uh do i think there's a a means of 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 causing that to happen so i would say in general with there were there may always be exceptions <laughs> in in uh in 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 life to different things but i would say that the spontaneous resolution uh, of an AVM or regression would be would be quite unusual and not something that would be typically expected. That makes sense. Thank you. Are there any factors that may trigger pulmonary AVM ruptures, and how can patients reduce the risk of rupture? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I, I think that um, the uh, the the best way of reducing the complications associated with pulmonary AVMs is to have them screened and monitored and assessed and treated if if that's indicated. Um, I think that's kind of the over the overarching theme of of, of reducing the risk of complications. There, there are probably some high risk times um, when someone um, uh, becomes pregnant. The the there's some changes with the blood flow and the blood volume, and and so there are probably high risk times. Uh, uh, that can be associated with pulmonary AVM complications. And so it, it highlights to a degree the importance of, of talking to, to people about if, if you are planning to become pregnant and, and getting the appropriate screening done uh, ahead of that time. Uh, but um, <clears throat> excuse me, I would say overall, the, the best way of reducing the complications to be, get, to, be to get screening uh, and, and regular monitoring performed. Thank you. Does having previous pulmonary AVMs increase the risk of having more AVMs down the road? My apologies. I think I heard does the does having previous pulmonary AVMs increase the risk of having pulmonary AVMs down the road? Is that was that the question? Okay, great. Um, I guess if if we're thinking of the development of new pulmonary pulmonary AVMs over time in that in that context, I think it can sometimes be a little bit tricky to tease out uh, some of those things because if somebody already has um, pulmonary AVMs, um, they many um, individuals with HHC will have more than one already, although maybe one will not be uh, large enough or, or uh, as the terminology previously used, significant enough to require treatment, whereas um, one might be and one might not be. And then the idea that we need to monitor is, is not just for the AVM that may have been treated, but for the smaller ones to know if they can grow and enlarge, because that is uh, something that can happen. The to my knowledge, and I welcome the opinion of others as well here, but to my knowledge, the um, 
development of a of a of a new AVM uh, in adulthood um, is a little bit uh, less well understood, and and part of that relates to the fact that we sometimes can have those micro AVMs, AVMs that are so small that cannot be seen, and and teasing out whether those are enlarging or a new AVM has developed can be uh, a bit of a challenge um, uh, from a radiographic perspective. And so I, I think that um, if someone already has pulmonary AVMs, I think they have uh, their, their lungs and, and their body has shown they can produce those. And, and if they can produce those, then they would be at risk of enlargement, at least of other AVMs over the, future, over, over the, the subsequent years. Uh, I, I'll just add one more thing. As technology improves, our ability to detect these AVMs is also getting better, right? So uh, maybe 15, 15 years back, uh, when we scanned patients, the CT scanners would only take images, say, at two millimeter thickness. So when you join all these images together, we were able to detect maybe larger AVMs only. Now we are scanning at 0.5 millimeter or less. That's one. And the second is we can actually scan even smaller than that with less radiation. The older scanners were scanning more with more radiation, right? So we tended to scan thicker to reduce the radiation risk to the patient. So both, both, are, both is happening. We can scan smaller with low radiation. So we are able to pick up smaller AVMs, right? So that's one. And second, as Dr. Appley mentioned, some of these can get bigger over time. And the other thing which we have seen, at least in the ones that are treated, it's not that the AVM is new, it's just that it has recruited additional blood vessels. Sometimes that can happen. So it may look as if it's a new AVM. It's actually just the normal blood vessel that has gotten bigger. So it all depends on what you want to call it. It's, you know, new blood vessels of a treated or an old AVM or an AVM that was not seen that is picked up. That makes sense, thank you. Relevant to a previously asked question, um, potentially clarification, how often should a potential pul pulmonary AVM be screened if there's been no change to the size and no symptoms? Would this be the five-year mark? This is the a pulmonary AVM that's already been identified on a CT scan, and then there hasn't been any change in size over some period of time. Yes, and no symptoms. And no symptoms. Yeah, um, I think uh, symptoms are obviously important uh, in all of these things, and and that's why that's um, an important uh, experience of someone with with uh, pulmonary AVMs. Uh, however, my my inclination in those scenarios is to try to um, look at um, the risk of that AVM becoming a problem in the future. And obviously something like past behavior can be informative of future behavior. And so if something has been stable for a period of time, then that's helpful to know. The exact interval um, over monitoring, particularly with CT scans when looking at um, the fact that those have radiation, um, uh, might be a bit individualized depending on the center, but also depending on the person and depending on other factors that may um, may be at uh, maybe maybe part of the situation has that individual had complications in the past. Have they had a, a you know unfortunate stroke or some other complication? Uh, how large is it, and how close might it be to treatment? Um, and and so there are some of these other factors that make it maybe a little bit hard to say. There's a one-size-fits-all approach to everyone with a, with a pulmonary AVM. You know, um, sometimes these things can be extended over multiple years, um, you know, three to five years in intervals. But I I, uh, I would say that the, the best answer, although somewhat uh, unsatisfying, may be that um, there, there can be sometimes an individualized approach to uh, the uh, monitoring of a, of a of an AVM based off some of the other factors, not just the presence or absence of it being there. 
Thank can you I, so much for it. Can I add a little comment to that too? I, I completely agree with Dr. Apperly. Um, but I just, I want to come back to the way that questions asked, because it was asked about how often we should screen someone who has lung AVMs. And, and, and I think Dr. Apperly was you know, kind of set this out earlier, but I want to come back to it. Screening is when someone doesn't have lung AVMs. So it's when we're looking for someone for AVMs and someone who has not had AVMs on their testing before. So if someone has had negative screening for lung AVMs, then we can, then we usually recommend repeat screening in five years. If someone has had a lung AVM already detected on, on imaging, whether it's treated or not, it's monitoring now. And I think Dr. Apperly has done a really nice job of talking about those two different terms. So this is really a question about monitoring. And I agree that it, it's individualized. And sometimes it'll be, we need to see you back in a year. And sometimes it might be two years. If for example, an, you know, one or two years, if an AVM might, need, might be getting close to the size where it needs treatment. But typically the furthest we'll go out in terms of monitoring is three years um, because we, we don't want to, the whole goal, this is the other part of the question is, even if someone's been asymptomatic, the whole goal is to do this kind of monitoring and do the screening and catch people, um, catch AVMs that need treatment long before they cause any symptoms. So, um, so we want everyone to be asymptomatic. And we want to screen every five years and monitor every three years in people that have disease uh, at, at a minimum, you know, so that, that's at least that that's our approach at the Toronto HHT center and is, and is pretty consistently the approach across North American HHT centers um, at, you know, to my knowledge. Thanks.